Welcome to this video on the Mages of the First Cabal from the tabletop role-playing game Mage the Ascension. The First Cabal was formed in the closing days of the Grand Convocation that created the Council of Nine Mystic Traditions. They were the first multi-tradition cabal created with the Council's blessing. Nine adepts, one from each tradition, embodying what their masters considered to be the best of their qualities. These were Daoud Allah of the Ali Batin, Fall Breeze of the Akashic Brotherhood, Sister Bernadette of the Celestial Chorus, Walking Hawk of the Dream Speakers, Cygnus Moro of the Euthanatos, Louis Dumont of the Order of Hermes, Acrites Salonicus of the Seers of Kronos, Eloine of the Verbena, and Helial Teoman of the Salificati, and leader of the First Cabal. In 1466, the First Cabal, also known as the March of the Nine, began their campaign across the world for the Council of Nine Mystic Traditions, combated the Order of Reason, the Nefandi and the Marauders, and entreated with both mages and sleepers to join the tradition side. It was a mission of goodwill, an adventure for the ages, that ended in tragedy. The First Cabal struck its first blow against the Cabal of Pure Thought in the French town of Garoche in 1467, freeing mages held captive by the Order of Reason. The First Cabal battled against the Gabrielite Templar Rivalon de Corby and his Legion de Triomphe, which ended up destroying the town and made an eternal enemy of de Corby. Two years later, the First Cabal attacked Kupala Alka, the stronghold of the infernalist warlord Tezgul the Insane, and banished his demon servants from that cursed place. However, they could not defeat Tezgul himself. In the spring of 1470, Halal Teomim, led by his self-righteous vision of unity, betrayed the first cabal to none other than Rivalon de Corby, who assembled a force of Templars, Iron Hounds, and mortal soldiers to attack the first cabal outside of Narbonne, France. Three members of the first cabal, Paul Breeze of the Akashic Brotherhood, Louis de Mont of the Order of Hermes, and Daoud Allah of the Ali Banu, fell in battle against the Gabrielites. Acrates Salonicus of the Seers of Kronos, later the Cult of Ecstasy, escaped to report the attack and the great betrayal to the Council. The remaining four, Cygnus Moro, Sister Bernadette, Walking Hawk, and Eloin, were captured and taken to Brian Castle to be tortured and executed. Cygnus Moro would die at the hands of the Inquisitors, but not before nearly freeing Eloin and slaying a dozen of his interrogators with death curses. In the summer, Acrates Salonicus led a force of mages to free the captured First Cabal from Brian Castle, first infiltrating and freeing the mages, then destroying the castle and its occupants. A few weeks later, Halal Teomim was captured and brought before the Tradition Council. After a trial in which he was condemned by those he had once led, he was found guilty of infernalism and treason. His sentences were to be Gilgal, the destruction of his twin avatars, and finally, the execution of his body. So it was in the winter of 1470 that Halal Teomim was destroyed, soul and body. What remained of the first cabal abandoned their mission, their traditions, and in the case of Eloine, magic itself. The Salificati abandoned the seat of matter and the traditions. In the aftermath of the first cabal, shelves of books have been written about their brief march, their motivations, their strengths, their shortcomings, and even some of their secrets. The most famous among these treatises is The Testament of the First Cabal, written by Hermetic Archmage Porthos Fitz Empress, who was also a contemporary of the First Cabal and a friend to some of the members. And so, after that introduction, without further ado, the Mages of the First Cabal. Fall Breeze The Akashic adept Fall Breeze was born as Zhiu Ling in a coastal village of China. Little to nothing is known of her early life save that her uncle was a fisherman. As a teenager, a master of the Brotherhood invited her to join them, where her talent quickly emerged and she was renamed Fall Breeze. She proved to be a quick study at the Art of Doe and Santana, making her mind as quick and deadly as her fists. She was also convivial, curious, and conversational. She empathized easily, but the only flaws her masters found in her were her temper and her restlessness. When frustrated, she could be brusque, or even dangerous. But her qualities exceeded her flaws, and she was chosen as part of the Akashic Brotherhood's delegation to the Great Convocation at the age of 17. During the nine years that the mages met, she impressed nearly everyone she met both with her beauty and skill. 
The mages of the Seers of Kronos, or the Cult of Ecstasy if you prefer, fascinated her with their passion and their use of hallucinogenics, a habit which would consume Fall Breeze before the end of her life. Fall Breeze's passion led her to certain unakashic fascinations with other mages, rarely consummated and quickly forgotten. When she was elected to join the first cabal, Fall Breeze quickly warmed to the learned Daoud Allah of the Ali Baden, and from him learned many languages. She found a father figure and companion in the dream speaker Walking Hawk, though there could have been more between them had they not been so different in age. She found the hermetic mage Louis Dumont honorable, even if he was disagreeable, and their debates were always heated but respectful. However, she had little love for the Rabina Elohim, and by extension the rest of her tradition. She also kept the euthanate of Cygnus Moro at arm's length, a dispute born from a previous life when the two had fought in the war between their traditions. When the Cabal was betrayed to the Order of Reason, Fall Breeze witnessed the last stand of Louis Dumont, which drove her mad with fury. She slew two Templars and a dozen mortals before the weapons and magics of the Order fatally wounded her, and she died in the arms of the Dream Speaker Walking Hawk. She was only 30 years old. Cygnus Morrow Cygnus Morrow was born in 1399 to slaves of an Indian merchant. His parents were Greek and Libyan respectively, while the boy, named Harun, was raised as a Muslim, due in part to growing up during the reign of Tamerlane. However, he was taken in by a cult of Kali worshippers. After freeing a group of Hindus from the Turks, he had a vision of himself in sexual congress with Kali, the Black Mother, the goddess of time, death, and destruction, during which his avatar awakened. Cygnus Morrow learned from waging war against the Mongols and Turks that some men, by the actions of their lives, earned the good death. And the usage of the word men here is intentional. During Morrow's life, he never once gave the good death to a woman. Women were, to his thinking, chosen by the Black Mother. He blended his beliefs in Kali with the goddess Artemis, a nod to his Greek heritage, the huntress whose arrows brought instant death. The connection between the two goddesses of death was an insight that would influence the rest of his tradition and their choice to change their name from Chakravanti to Euthanatos, meaning good death. To further elaborate of Cygnus' reverence for goddesses, he was said to treat every one of his female associates and lovers as though they were a goddess. He never married, though he had many lovers and many more children. As one of the death mages, his magic was incredibly subtle, preferring to affect probabilities, entropy, and mental states. He targeted for the good death those who were suffering from their own greed and cruelty. Often he would study these candidates for days or weeks before he descended on them, not like a storm, but as a shadow. He was compassionate, but a merciless killer, and no one who died at his hands suffered long, if at all. As a warrior, he was one of the best in his tradition. Among the first cabal, only Fall Breeze and Daoud Allah could best him in non-magical combat. As a thinker, he was a master strategist and tactician, though he could be bested by Louis Dumont at Halal Tailman. Despite his lethality, or perhaps because of it, Cygnus was an incredibly charismatic, jovial, and generous man, making him distinct from the rest of his generally morose tradition. His upbringing as a slave hardened his mind and body, but not his heart. He had compassion for the persecuted and the enslaved, and loved literature, logic, religion, and mathematics, subjects he discussed at great length with Daoud Allah and Halal Teoman. In truth, Moro was very nearly the leader of the first cabal, but the Akashic Brotherhood would not stand for it. Daoud Allah did not like Cygnus Moro at first, but the young man's generous spirit won the old warrior scholar over and by the end, the Ali Baden considered the Euthanatos as a son. Even the solitary and contemplative hermetic Louis Dumont, in his journal, wrote that Cygnus Morrow was a man whose generous compassion was matched only by his skill at dispatching the unwanted from his sight. His is the power of the man who needs no proof of his virility. The two often tested each other at chess and sertiment, both of which Dumont usually won. Cygnus Morrow met his end in a dungeon at the hands of the Order of Reason. To his credit, he nearly freed his fellow cabal mate Elohim and slew a dozen inquisitors before he finally died. After the traditions recovered his broken body, his remains were immolated. Ten of the women in attendance, his lovers, threw themselves upon his funeral pyre. Louis Dumont 
Louis Dumont was a child of both the Hermetic tradition and the Ascension War. He was quite literally born into House Casitor, then known as House Gernicus, the great judge of the Order of Hermes. He was devoted to his house until it came under attack by the Inquisitors of the Order of Reason. The surprise attack led to the death of his parents, his family, his friends, and the destruction of his covenant. Louis escaped, but the scars it left were deeper than flesh and bone. He then strove to become a truly great quesitor, or judge. He buried himself in the study of Hermeticism, logic, law, and religion. He armed himself in impartiality and wisdom to keep the rest of the world at bay. While he grew into a respected and skilled mage, he was noted to be a dark, dispassionate man, haunted by the past, who gave his learning to many and his confidence to few. But one of those few was Master Baldric LaSalle Bonnie Titulus, one of the mages who pulled the Grand Convocation together and insisted on Dumont's inclusion in the proceedings. For years, Dumont had acted as LaSalle's courier and emissary between the fractious houses of the Order of Hermes. Interestingly, Dumont spoke out against any union of the traditions that eliminated the unique history and practices of its members. This infuriated some of his fellow hermetics, but when Dumont argued, it was always without emotionality or bias. But Dumont did have a passion, one held deeply in his heart, the creation of a magic paradigm inclusive of all others, without diminishing them that could resist the encroachment of both the church and the order of reason. His appointment to the first cabal was met with some dismay within the order of Hermes. Dumont was a reserved man who spoke little and held himself apart from his fellow mages, some of whom took his distance for a rebuff. But because he was so self-contained, when he spoke, his words carried merit. Even Halal Tailman sought Louis' counsel, especially to resolve differences between the cabal. In time, the members of the first cabal came to Louis themselves to mediate between them. Even so, Louis' relationship with most of his fellow mages was strained. Daoud Allah was extravagant as Louis was practical, loquacious where Louis was succinct, and martial where Louis was bookish. His disdain for the church extended to Sister Bernadette, and he regarded Walking Hawk and Fall Breeze as too strange and foreign for his liking. However, Cygnus Morrow won his trust, as he had with so many others, with his charm and good humor. And Eloween, he admired her even as he was mystified by her. She sang, danced, and spoke with an ease and freedom of spirit and body that he could only dream of with his short, stocky frame. But he had no easy smiles for her like Morrow, no cosmopolitan experience like Daoud Allah, and certainly none of the charisma and unearthly beauty of Halal Teoman. Eloine would never know Louis' feelings for her, and Louis would do his best not to dwell on them. As Louis traveled with the first cabal, it did nothing to quiet his doubts about the other traditions. In fact, he began to believe that perhaps the order of reason had valid arguments, if only they would separate themselves from the influence of the church. His thoughts proved prophetic, as the order of reason would do just that, only at a later date. By the end, Louis de Mott may have mistrusted the traditions, but he was loyal to the first cabal. When the order of reason descended on them, Dumont brought the might of his command of forces to bear against the Templars and Inquisitors. A storm of lightning and wind and blood, along with a lifetime of anger, fear and pain unleashed in moments. But Dumont paid the price that all mages must for such vulgar displays of power. Paradox ripped his body apart, cracked his bones and burned him to ashes, along with many of his enemies. Daoud Allah Daoud Allah Abu Hisham ibn Mukla al-Baghdadi was the oldest member of the first cabal. He claimed to have fought at the side of the Egyptian Sultan Saladin and against the Mongol Kagan Temujin, which would place him at over 300 years in age when he joined the Grand Convocation, though he claimed to be four centuries old. The Beloved of God was a warrior scholar whose panoply included a Turkic scimitar, a Japanese tachi, longbow, javelins, and spears, all of which he had mastered. His combat prowess was furthered by his magical prowess as he used correspondence, forces, and spirit spheres of magic, giving him the effectiveness of a company of soldiers. In addition to martial skill, Daoud Allah was a learned man, a polyglot who could speak Arabic, French, English, Italian, Greek, Latin, Egyptian, Mongolian, Japanese, Cantonese, along with being well-versed with the literature and cultures of each of these peoples. Despite his history of killing crusaders, 
He was a student of Christian theology and found much in it to admire, even if he opposed the policies of the Christian kings in their church. Among the first cabal, Daoud Allah was generally respected, even by those who found reason to dislike him. He and Halal Taomim formed a friendship based on their intelligence and culture, and spent much of the time discussing their differing philosophies on alchemy, magic, and civilization. Fall Breeze found in Daoud Allah a warrior who was the equal of many masters of Do, albeit with weapons rather than empty hands, and the two would often test each other's martial skill. To Cygnus Moro, Daoud Allah was a surrogate father who could best the death mage in combat and temper his youthful vanity and passions with patient wisdom. To the seer Acritus Salonicus, they were fellow men of Persia who shared a language and a taste for finery, albeit from different generations. But Salonicus also saw in Daoud Allah a state approaching perfection, as Acrates was a mage who dealt with time, and Daoud Allah was the longest lived and one of the wisest members of the first cabal. Even Sister Bernadette, who would have a great reason to dislike Daoud Allah, respected him, and the two often talked of Christianity and Islam, even if they could not agree by the end. Louis Dumont and Walking Hawk, however, misliked Daoud Allah. Walking Hawk feared appearing foolish in comparison to the worldly and erudite Batini mage. Dumont looked at Daoud Allah as a vain cosmopolitan peacock, strutting around in Persian finery better suited to a nobleman, and prattling on about this place or that. It did not help that Daoud Allah was a great many things that Dumont was not. But the greatest rift was with the Verbena Elohim, and perhaps the most unfortunate, as it was due to a misunderstanding. Daoud Allah, for all his experience, was a devout Muslim, so when he witnessed Elohim and her naked and occasionally bloody devotions to the Earth Mother, he commented that the women of Persia did not behave in such a manner, and the consequences for doing so. Elohim took his questions and comments for reproach, and answered him with anger, until the two only spoke when it came to matters concerning the first cabal. When the Order of Reason attacked, Daoud Allah's swords, spears, and arrows dispatched more foes than the skilled fists of Fall Breeze or the sorceries of Louis de Mont. But the great Persian warrior finally fell beneath the tide of Gabrielite steel. Even in the modern days, the Ali Baden honor the name of Daoud Allah as one of their greatest mages. Sister Bernadette Perhaps the longest lived of the members of the first cabal following its destruction, Bernadette's life was shaped by the events around her. She was born between 1417 and 1421 in Domremy, France, five years after the birth of a certain future saint in the same village, Jean La Pucelle, or Jeanne d'Arc, or if you insist, Joan of Arc. As a child, Bernadette was sickly, though whether she was afflicted with the Black Death is unclear. During a bout of sickness in which her death seemed certain, she was visited by angels who gifted her with holy knowledge and wisdom. When she awoke, her sickness was cured, and her parents gave her over to the Black Friars, or the Dominicans. Sister Bernadette, as she came to be known, was one of the greatest healers and singers in the history of the Celestial Chorus. A quirk of Bernadette's awakening is that she only communicated through song. Additionally, when Bernadette was conflicted, she manifested copies of herself to debate the matter, also through song, something that a few of her fellow members of the First Cabal, specifically Fall Breeze and Walking Hawk, found unnerving about her. But the depth and power of her songs resound through the ages and remain in the archives of the Celestial Chorus, though not recorded by Bernadette herself, as she could neither read nor write. She considered literacy to be a vanity, one that could only be entrusted to the learned of the Church. Little remains of her time with the Dominicans, but she performed some manner of service with the Inquisition, and used her power to identify its enemies. Bernadette saw the world in black and white, good and evil, Christian and heretic. Even mages, who she believed were akin to angels, were capable of falling. If only she knew. Those who could not be healed of their heresy had to be destroyed. After leaving the Dominicans to become a wandering healer, she joined the retinues of several apocalyptic preachers and prophets, only to leave each in turn. One night she somehow turned up in horizon, near death, on the door of the Primus of the Celestial Chorus, Master Valorin. The Primus personally nursed Bernadette back to health. During her convalescence, she learned of the Celestial Chorus 
and took up its ways of magic. Despite her age and affiliation with the Inquisition, Bernadette was always delicate and naive, even when bundled in the black robe of a Dominican. During her time with the First Cabal, she had few real companions. As stated before, Walking Hawk and Fall Breeze avoided her because of her strange singing speech. Louis de Mont had the same scorn for Bernadette that he held for all members of the church, though his animus might have turned ugly if he had known she was a member of the Inquisition. Bernadette, fearful of the literati, considered Dumont a haughty and heretical scholar. She kept a safe distance between her and Acritus Salonicus, not because she regarded him as sinful, but rather because she regarded him as desirable. In service to the Dominicans, Bernadette had sworn vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity, and the seductive ecstatic mage Acritus sorely tested the last vow with his good looks and charm. She shared a respectful relationship with Daoud Allah, despite their differences. She was surprised at the depth of his study when it came to Christianity, which at first intrigued her, but later annoyed her as it revealed her own lack of scholarly acumen. The Persian mage even figured out that Bernadette had served the Inquisition, though he kept the secret to himself, as he respected her privacy and enjoyed the purity of her songs, songs of devotion and faith, unburdened by theological complexity or political machinations. Bernadette's admiration for Daoud Allah cooled as she could never comprehend how a man like him could express regard for Christ, yet pray daily to Mecca. Her only real friend in the first cabal was the Verbena Elohim. Whether their friendship was born from the mutual sympathies of women or from some connection of their awakened souls, they shared a bond that was immediate and apparent to all in the first cabal, despite the differences between them. That bond was broken by none other than their leader, Halal Teomem. Both women desired the solificado, though only Elohim acted upon that desire, as she shared his tent and bore his children, while Bernadette's love for both of them twisted into frustrated anger even as she midwife for Elohim and her twins. When the first cabal was destroyed and survivors consigned to the dungeons, Halal Teobim came to Bernadette in her cell to try and convince her to join the Order of Reason and return to the Inquisition. It was during this interview that Bernadette rejected Teobim completely, seeing the Salificado's dark destiny. Bernadette would survive the destruction of the first cabal and lived until the 18th century, traveling the world to heal it of its wounds, and in turn, her own. Not even the dungeon of the Cabal of Pure Thought could strip her of her innocence of spirit, yet the experience had left its scar upon her soul. The tale of her life and journeys were recorded by her deathbed confessor in the Song of Bernadette. Walking Hawk Walking Hawk was born to the Seneca people and raised to be a warrior. After an attack on his clan by an enemy tribe, Walking Hawk became war chief at the ripe age of 16. He would become a terror to his foes in the following years, and his war path was spoken of with dread for generations. Even when he took a wound to the leg from a Huron warrior that left him with a permanent limp, it did not limit his fighting skill. However, war was not his destiny. During a raid, his war party was ambushed and he took a wound after fighting his way free. As he lay on the ground dying, the spirit of the wolf came to him and offered to save his life, if he buried his tomahawk and became a medicine man. So he gave up war thereafter and learned how to make medicine and soon was renowned among the tribes for his ability to heal, as he had been for his skill at destruction. In addition to medicine, Walking Hawk would receive prophetic visions through dreams and ceremonial dances. It was one of these visions that led him to construct a special canoe to carry him across the ocean to the Grand Convocation of Awakened Mages. If Star of Eagles, who would co-found the Dream Speaker's tradition alongside his wife Nyoba, were exotic to the mages of the convention, Walking Hawk was a spectacle. Tall, black-eyed, dressed in tan hide loincloth, tunic and leggings, with a bright red iro ending in a topknot embellished with feathers. He had a bearing more akin to a king than that of a wizard. His gift for prophecy and ability to commune with spirits are what spurred the newly formed dream speakers to offer Walking Hawk as their representative to the first cabal. For Walking Hawk, it was a long four years. The lands through which they traveled only made him long for the fields and forests and lakes of his home. In the cities and towns through which they traveled, 
Walking Hawk heard the spirits of the land and water crying out in anguish, dying slowly. As he saw what some men did to earth and spirits, he felt the anger that led him to paint his tomahawk red with blood rise, threatening to choke out his hard-earned wisdom. Few of the first cabal wanted to understand him, and few tried to. Yet Walking Hawk was perhaps the most loyal of the first cabal, as the March of the Nine took its toll on his mind and soul. His closest companion was Fall Breeze. Walking Hawk had buried his tomahawk as Wolf required, but he still admired her skill as a warrior, her willingness to learn, and her easy laughter, which raised his own spirits. He taught her some of the skills he developed during his time as a war chief, which he quickly adopted, though he could not teach her his magic, nor she teach him hers. If he had been a younger man, Walking Hawk would have gladly made Fall Breeze his wife, though there was too much distance and time there, so Walking Hawk was satisfied with her friendship and trust. Fall Breeze looked to Walking Hawk as a mentor, full of earth wisdom, though he tended to brood which troubled her. Another cabal member Walking Hawk was fond of was Acritus Selenicus. The seer was a pike carrier like Walking Hawk, though some of the things Acritus shared with Walking Hawk left him feeling as though the earth or sky might swallow him whole. More importantly, Selenicus appreciated the importance of stories and was a capable storyteller in his own right. The two often traded tales around the fire after a long day's travel. Like many others in the Cabal, Walking Hawk respected Daoud Allah, even if he envied him slightly when he trained in combat with Fall Breeze. But Daoud Allah's god was strange to him. The Persian mage sounded as though he worshipped the Great Spirit, yet his god would only speak to him through a little bundle of leaves he called a book. Walking Hawk's relationship with the rest of the Cabal was chillier. Louis de Mont dismissed him as being little better than an unlearned savage. At first he considered Eloine a possible kindred spirit, as she too revered the earth. But as they traveled, Walking Hawk thought that the spirits guiding Eloine were dark and not to be trusted. And he alone of the first cabal never liked or trusted Halal Teoman. He had seen no such creature of the earth or spirit world like Teoman, and a single body should not house two souls, much less two souls at odds with each other. What's more, Tao Mim's style of argument, the Walking Hawk, seemed to cause more confusion and division than union, and understanding among the First Cabal. It was Walking Hawk who warned the First Cabal of the Order of Reason's impending attack on them. He was taken, stripped and tortured by the Gabrielites, the rescued along with the other survivors. He was a key witness against Halal Tao Mim, even as he demanded allowance to carve out Tao Mim's two hearts and eat them. Following Tailman's execution, Star of Dreams used his magic to return Walking Hawk home. The loss of Fall Breeze weighed heavily on him for the years after, even as he became a prophet for his people, warning them against the coming of the Order of Reason. The tribes responded to his prophecy by joining together in the Iroquois Confederation. Eloine Eloine was born in Ireland to awaken magi who were followers of the Wick. Her parents were friends and contemporaries of Nightshade before she became Primus of the Verbena. They were keepers of the old way and participants in the Decade of the Hunt when they, along with Nightshade's other allies, including the Fae, hunted down the remnants of General Christopher Wingard's army, which had previously invaded Britain and Ireland in the name of the Order of Reason. Some of these gave their blood to the Wick, offered up on Eloine's own dagger. Her parents also taught her how to feel the pulse of the earth and sing to the spirit world. When she arrived at Horizon for the Great Convocation, she was a powerful mage in her own right, and the elements danced at her fingertips as she danced to hear the earth. The Verbena were a new tradition with members much stronger, older, and more respected. Yet Nightshade chose Eloine for her enthusiasm, her purity of spirit, and her wildness as the tradition's representative to the first cabal. Even during the convocation, she scandalized the more austere mages of the gathering with her sensuality. She went barefoot in most places and did little to conceal her womanly shape from anyone. There was no artifice or calculation in her displays. She reveled in what the great tree and the earth mother had given her. Nightshade saw in Eloween all that was good in the wick and what the verbena could become. Of the first cabal, Eloween's strongest relationship was with two of the mages. The first was Bernadette, 
The bond between them is as unlikely in its closeness as it was tragic in its breaking. The Akashics say their avatars were bonded through some event in some previous incarnation, and even now in the modern day, the two circle each other through multiple lives, whether as allies or to settle some unresolved business. The cult of ecstasy claims that they were lovers, which is their explanation for most all human interactions. And anyone who knew Sister Bernadette would find the claim to be absurd. In Eloine's last remembrances, she wrote of her love of Bernadette's song, her admiration of the sister's concealed, fragile beauty. The other relationship, and the most infamous, was with Halal Tailman of the Solificati, who had been her lover and her betrayer. From their union was born twins. Rather than be objects of joy, the children only widened the rifts between the mages of the first cabal. Tailman became colder, more distant, until finally he led the Order of Reason right to the First Cabal's hidden camp. Fall Breeze, Daoud Allah, and Louis de Mont died trying to defend the Cabal. For Eloine, death might have been preferable, not because of the torture she would be subjected to, but because the Knights of the Order tore her children from her, and she would never see them again, nor bear any more. When she was rescued from the dungeons of the Cabal of Pure Thought, she was a scarred and broken woman, in body and spirit. In the span of just four years, she had gone from maiden to mother to crone. She could be found in the nights in Horizon, crying for her children and searching for them in some corner of the far realm, though she never said their names. Even in the depths of her grief and madness, Eloine remembered that names carried power. After Tailmim's Gilgul and execution, Eloine forsook magic and wandered the earth until she was captured by the Inquisition and burned as a witch. However, her remembrances indicated a renewal of her faith in the goddess and ascension before the end. Acrites Salonicus Acrites Salonicus was, or perhaps still is, the greatest time traveler in the history of the seers of Kronos, the cult of ecstasy. He was born the son of a Persian slave and a Greek soldier. Even in childhood, Acrates would have visions of the past and future, a small taste of the power that would both shape him and curse him. His mother was aware of his visions and did her best to conceal them from his father, who was a kind but stern man and despaired of ever making Acrates into a proper man. Even as a youth, Acrates danced on the knife's edge between order and chaos. When he was expelled from the University at Constantinople, it was the final straw for Acrates' father, who disowned the young man in favor of a child born to his legal wife. Acrates' awakening was guided by the seer Pratiti, who saw the youth's powerful gift and worked to teach him to develop his precognition. But Acrates would do one better. So great was his talent that he managed to leap forward in time to the 20th century, smash through the time gauntlet constructed by the technocracy, and viewed the modern world under the technocracy's domination. Needless to say, he was horrified by what he saw, a reality all but stripped of magic. When he returned, paradox hung around him in the form of a cloud of hashish smoke, when he was excited. Acrates Salonikas journeyed throughout Persia, teaching the tools and arts of ecstasy to the sleepers, and through them, awakening the sacred passions that opened the door through which time could be viewed. To his thinking, Order must periodically be disrupted to prevent the rot that comes from stasis. That a little chaos, strategically applied, could break the chains that enslaved humans, whether they be physical chains or spiritual ones. Acrates is one of the most controversial mages of the first cabal, because he believed that it was his duty to break the limitations that his fellow mages imposed on themselves. He certainly was the most colorful figure among them, a tall, classically handsome youth dressed in Persian finery with shining dark eyes, a square jaw, and broad shoulders. The cult of ecstasy claims that Acrates seduced every member of the first cabal, though this is most likely pure salacious gossip on their part. What is true is that Acrates often played the gadfly and devil's advocate in the first cabal, taking positions in opposition to others to spur them to view a different perspective. Of all the mages of the first cabal, Acrates Salonikus was probably the closest to Halal Teomim. The Salificado was, to Acrates, the father he wished for, one whose intellect could direct his questing and rebellious spirit towards productive results 
without shackling his desire for freedom. Akrates also admired Daoud Allah. The two were sons of Persia, but Daoud Allah was a being who contained lifetimes, and time allowed one to move closer to ascension, which made Daoud Allah being closer to perfection than Akrates. He was also close to Walking Hawk through their shared love of stories, though Akrates liked to embellish his tales or talk of things long past or yet to be, for which Walking Hawk had no point of reference. Fall Breeze was, for a time, smitten with Akrates' lustfulness and easy sensuality, though how much of this was by design is unknown. He also tried to charm and ply everyone in the first cabal. Some of the members, like Sister Bernadette, Cygnus Moro, and Louis de Mont, considered him frivolous at best and a sly manipulator at worst. When the Legion de Triomphe attacked the first cabal, Acritus Salonicus fled rather than stand his ground with the others. For this act, some mages damn him for a coward. Yet, if he hadn't, the survivors of the first cabal would have all died, whether in battle against the order of reason or in the dungeons of the cabal of pure thought. After the execution of Halal Teomim, Acrates condemned himself to exile in the Arctic for his actions, for he too had betrayed the first cabal. To save humanity, magic, and from his perspective as one who could see into the far future, his dear friend, Halal. Halal Teomim, the twin lights of the morning star, the great alchemist, creator of the philosopher's stone, the rebus, leader of the first cabal, and its great betrayer. Tracing the origins of the awakened alchemist leads to Italy and the two people who would become Halal Teomim, Julius de Medici and Mia de Napoli. Julius was a young son of the merchant family, possibly an illegitimate child. There is no direct proof of bastardy, however. After his awakening, the great Medici family promptly disowned Julius and cast him out. Ironically, this sudden and harsh rejection may be what drove him to alchemy and the Salificati. Mia de Napoli remains of unknown origin, raised in the gutters of Naples, her lineage a mystery even after centuries of investigation. She was, at various points in her life, a thief and a prostitute. Some speculate that she worked for an assassin, but the evidence of this is dubious. The creation of Halal Teomim was a work of alchemy, one of the greatest achieved, however, it was an imperfect working. The creation of a rebus, a joining of separate, opposing qualities, in particular male and female, required the joining of souls into a single being, and in this, Teomim was a failed experiment, because the souls of Julius de Medici and Mia de Napoli could not be perfectly fused. Instead of one, there were two, connected within a single flesh. Teomim largely kept this internal conflict to himself, but it was reflected in how Teomim spoke and appeared. The Salificati adept would occasionally refer to himself as I, or we, or both in the same sentence. Physically, he most often appeared to have an oval face with brown hair, narrow eyes, thin eyebrows, a pointed nose, and thick lips. But his appearance shifted daily, sometimes in the moment. Some days he appeared male, others female, still others an unusual combination of both. His eyes could be brown one moment, green another, blue or hazel, or even violet. However he appeared, Tailmim was by all accounts a being of supernatural beauty who captured the attention of even those who despised him. But Tailmim was also a brilliant mage. Thoughtful, eloquent, forceful, and cunning, the Council of Primae elected him to lead the First Cabal. In Halal Tailmim, nearly every member of the First Cabal found something to admire. To Louis de Mont, Tailmim was the friend who understood his melancholy and his wisdom. For Acrates Salonicus, Halal Teomim was a tempering force who guided the wild but brilliant mage to even greater heights through friendship and gentle discipline. To Daoud Allah, Halal Teomim was an intellectual peer, the first he had met in many long centuries, and a being unlike any he had encountered before. Yet as time passed, Teomim withdrew from the first cabal, and they from him, until Teomim made the decision to betray the first cabal to the order of reason. If you have listened to the stories of the other members, you should be familiar by now with what happened. Tailmen went to the Order of Reason, led them to the first cabal, some of whom were slain and the rest taken captive, tortured, and later freed by Acrates Salonicus. 
For his part, Tailman was later captured, tried, and executed. The Salificati were in turn excommunicated from the Council of Nine and the Traditions, and every recording referring to Halal Tailman was appended with a new title, Thoaba, Abomination. But before Halal Tailman was executed, he was permitted to say his final words. Tailman addressed the crimes for which he had been charged and convicted, infernalism and betrayal. Tailman claimed that he was no Barabbai. He had lived and would die having bowed before no god, spirit, or demon, nor did any such being have anything to bargain with Tailman that Tailman could not acquire for himself. As to betrayal, Tailman admitted guilt, though he claimed his betrayal was in service to a greater good. Halal Tailman confessed that the great betrayal had struck him to his heart. He had never meant for any of them to die only that they be captured, and then use their capture to rally the traditions to rescue them and destroy the order of reason. Halal Teomim simultaneously praised the traditions for their unity in capturing him, even as he condemned them for their infighting and short-sightedness. As for Teomim's impending death, the fallen Salificato claimed that it would be a mercy, freeing his mind from the torment of his betrayal and his souls from whatever hell awaits traitors. As a final warning, Tailman warned that if the traditions would not unite as one to destroy the order of reason, then his own death would seem peaceful compared to what awaited for them. It was in the hut of Tormond of Carcinus that Acrates Salonicus saw the future, or rather, the future of his friend Halal Tailman. Every potential future Acrates saw in which Halal survived led to the same place. Tailmim's betrayal of the traditions, the death of magic, and the enslavement of humanity forever. Acrates secretly sought out the archmages of the seers of Kronos, who verified that his prophecy, the predictum apocalypsis, or the prophecy of the apocalypse, was true. There was no future where Halal Tailmim lived in which he did not betray the traditions. If he was allowed to escape, he would destroy the traditions from without killing, enslaving, or seducing mages to the order of reason. If Tailman were captured and imprisoned, he would manage to win converts to his cause even in confinement until he was freed and the traditions united with the order of reason in service to the vision of unity of Halal Tailman Thoabath. The armies of the Thoabath marched across the face of the earth, shining like the noonday sun yet empty as the void within. These troops were once men but they were reduced to automatons, mindless golems of flesh. All crafts, traditions, conventions, and methodologies are united beneath Tailmim's banner. All who oppose Tailmim, major sleeper, are destroyed without mercy, cast into pits of acid, along with any scribblings that might threaten Tailmim's regime. Those who remain are bred like livestock to produce the most beneficial servants and slaves. No child in Thoabath's world will ever feel the warmth of a mother's womb, nor hear her heartbeat or voice. All children are born of tubes and containers, and nursed in sterile creches, but not before their brains are altered by machines. Fine, delicate things that cut and remove the possibility of imagination or intuition, or the possibility of ascension, though a handful are spared so that they will grow to be the betrayer's commanders, satraps, and scholars. Under Thoabath's rule, there is no more need for ascension, only reason and obedience. It is this obedience that compels Thoabath's servants to create prison camps where humanity is debased, tortured and broken, until only monsters emerge. Thoabath's power grows as humanity withers. In time, he severs the earth from the rest of the Tellurian before dispatching his armies to subjugate all realms and worlds. But they do not march for Halal Teomim, Instead, it is another name that brings what was humanity to its knees and forces every soul in the Tellurian to quake with fear. That name is Moloch. There is a remnant that has escaped the talons of the great betrayer. Using Moloch's own machines, a handful of awakened and sleepers fled the earth for a distant realm, one that Moloch cannot reach, intending to never return. But for Moloch himself, escape is impossible. Once, Moloch dreamed of creating a paradise of perfection and unity, 
Instead, it has ruined humanity forever and turned the earth into a hell. Moloch remembers that it was once something else, something better, but cannot recall when it started down the path to domination and tyranny. It knew it was being watched across time by someone it had once known, someone who had been a friend. Moloch, the tyrant, the merciless, the betrayer, desired to be freed from the prison it had created, even if that meant annihilation. This prophecy, this future, is why Halal Teobim had to die. The first cabal was betrayed by their leader and sacrificed by their friend to save magic and humanity from a being that would have destroyed everything. And what are the lives of five mages against the fate of the entire world? And those were the mages of the first cabal. The Testament of the First Cabal was an interesting book, kind of an anthology, but not really. Now, I have never used any part of this in any game of Mage I've played in, though it has its interesting parts. The First Cabal kind of reminds me of the founders of the Camarilla, except that the founders won their war and remade the world of vampires in their likeness, where the First Cabal failed and the order of reason dominates the paradigm of reality. It's a little ironic that immortal, inhuman, and paranoid predators can put aside their differences and get things done easier than tradition mages. Rereading over the Testament of the First Cabal and Mage the Sorcerer's Crusade, a good chunk of the First Cabal's failure can probably be laid at the doorstep of the Council of the Nine Mystic Traditions. They chose the supposed best of their traditions rather than the mages most inclined to teamwork. Instead of a master alchemist who destroys everyone with facts and logic, the traditions probably should have found their equivalent of a, let's say, Commander Shepard, who could build a team and gel it together, and is such a leader that people would want to follow them on a suicide mission to battle galaxy-destroying cybernetic demigods. And segueing from galaxy-destroying demigods, it's interesting how Tailman was prophesied to become Moloch, lord of a cybernetic dystopia and possible superpowered conqueror of the cosmos with legions of chemically and cybernetically modified slave soldiers commanded by a few exceptional commanders and scientists left with the intelligence or wits to advance his agenda. This program sounds familiar, but I can't quite put my finger on where I've heard it before. Oh well, that's all I have for now. Until next time.